Hello, and welcome to another edition of The Open Road, a podcast where we examine different aspects of open source and open source community. My name is Brian Prophet. And I'm Rich Bowen. In today's episode, we will be discussing another aspect of DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And this is going to be around the question of anonymity in in uh, project communities. With so many people participating in project communities anonymously or with some kind of pseudonym, uh, it can be difficult, we postulated, to determine the actual demographics of your project. And so this is this is something that we asked our various uh, our various guests. Yeah, and it's not just the determination of, of the demographics of your community, which is important, but it also, um, the anonymity has also been somewhat weaponized um, in recent years because people will um, use it to attack others in communities um, and not really give them a fair shake. Um, so there's a lot of different aspects of this. Um, And so when we talk to our guests about this, we basically put forth the question, how do you handle this this idea of dealing with diversity in a fair way um, in communities that have been, you know, or have become more, you know, anonymous um, as the case may be. That's not true for every community, of course, but some of the larger ones, it can be an issue. So our first guest is Demetrius Cheatham, who is the Director of Inclusion and Belonging Strategy at GitHub. And we talked to Demetrius about, you know, what it, what it's all about to work with communities that are really anonymous. And here's what she had to say. Let me tell you, you just asked a question that I think about a lot. Here's the thing, right? Avatars and profiles and being able to be anonymous that used to be one of the the the, the prize things about open source right that was one of the selling points if you will the whole notion about how you could be anyone from anywhere and your contributions are valued right no matter yeah. who you are but then we started seeing the not so good side of that several studies came out highlighting gender bias in open source right where people who chose to make their identities known especially women started Mm -hmm. seeing that when they made contributions, they were ignored or their contributions were just outright rejected. So that good thing of anonymity and open source, it started becoming something that was necessary now in order to even participate and to have your your voice heard. And even worse, it was used now to avoid bullying and harassment. Like women and, and people from underrepresented backgrounds started creating avatars holding themselves out as, you know, as white men or something like that, because they said that's the only way that they can avoid all of these negative behaviors. So I think that's also the question you're asking, like that Mm -hmm. anonymity, it also gives the bullies, those that are doing the harassment, the trolls, it now gives them a vehicle to hide. And this is making it bad for everyone. So as part of all in, we, like I mentioned, we launched a maintainers listening tour where we asked maintainers and community leaders, what are some of the challenges they saw with advancing DEI within their communities? And what we heard were just so many stories about people leaving communities, not because of what had been directly happened or, or done or said to them, but by what they witnessed being done and said to others, the trolls, what they were saying to the other contributors. And then when that behavior started being more and more unchecked, They said, we can't even be here and witness this. So we're leaving. So that's why as part of All In, we're focusing a lot on code of conduct, specifically code of conduct enforcement within communities and making sure communities and community leaders are equipped with understanding how to address these behavior, to apply the interventions when needed, de-escalate conflict, and how to appropriately enforce code of conduct violations as well when necessary. So what Demetrius uh, really capitalized on is something that is very, you know, I'm very passionate about, and that is codes of conduct, um, and really focused in on that as the proper tool to get around a lot of the hurdles that anonymity has provided for people who are not good actors in a community. It's interesting because when 
when we first started talking about asking this question, I was thinking more in terms of metrics, demographics. How do you measure what people are intentionally preventing you from seeing? Mm -hmm. But that really wasn't even something that she's concerned about. This this was this was um, obviously born out of a lot of thought around how people are, like you said, weaponizing anonymity to be bad actors without consequences. And uh, also, you know, this other aspect, this other toxic aspect where people feel like they have to be anonymous to protect themselves. And it's it's really, it's really an indictment of our of our open source culture that that that's where the conversation went. It, it makes me sad, but uh, it's not it's not what I had thought going in. So it's really something to, to think about here. Well, and, and as you say that, that is kind of the journey that I took to get to that place because as somebody who's involved a lot with community analytics and data and, and mm -hmm. um, you know, getting demographics around a community is part of my job. But as I've done this, it's quickly become very apparent that even just going out and benignly asking people, hey, what gender do you identify with? What race do you identify with? What, what country or nationality do you identify with? Anything like that, there are there is always resistance yeah. for the reasons that you just described, um, that people don't want to you know, reveal, um, even, even in an uh, uh, um, aggregated situation, that they might be there. The, the one example that we, we pushed is, you know, uh, and I think this is anecdotal, but you know, there's there's a, a certain community um, where there was a demographic survey, um, and it was a it was a global survey, but in that region, somebody had identified themselves as a, a trans individual, um, and because the region itself was so small, any amount of aggregation did not matter because mm -hmm. now you had a group of less than I think twenty people. And now they're looking around going, well, wait, which one of us is trans, you know? So it, again, a completely unintended consequence because in the global scheme, that data would have been lost. Um, but even on a regional or smaller level, um, yeah. aggregation doesn't always work to protect people and, and hold their privacy. Um, so that's sort of where I kind of came to this is that, you know, when you, you want to just ask the question and everybody's like, mm, maybe not, you know, mm -hmm. um, that's, that's how it comes up. And I shouldn't say everybody, but there is resistance from a lot of people. And understandably, with, mm -hmm. with these being some of the consequences of, you know, being identified as, as the other and then targeted for that. Yeah. And, and so the focus on code of conduct, you know, we're going to be talking about code of conduct in some future, uh, series. So uh, that's something we'll definitely come back to a bunch, but, but uh, you know, some of the, the, the same people that resist having a code of conduct um, are some of the ones who, who also resist having any sort of diversity effort mm -hmm. because they're unwilling to admit that it's, that it's a problem. And, uh, you know, I, I think that, you know, telling on myself a little bit here, I think that it's interesting that you and I both came at this from a from a metrics and demographics point of view, and at least for myself, had not really thought deeply about this other dark side of the question, and and that that may be because we're in the privileged group that doesn't have to think about this as much. Mm -hmm. So that's that's something to consider um, when when addressing questions like this, you got to be sure to include all voices in the conversation or the conversation becomes meaningless. Yeah. Another thing that um, uh, Demetra said that I I, um, I took note of was when she described that they were sometimes they were seeing people leaving communities mm -hmm. based on actions that others had done to others in their community. And this is again why you should have a code of conduct because you know, the it's not just a set of rules and, and civil behavior, it's actually, it's actually also an enforcement uh, mechanism. So you have a way to say, okay, here's the line you actually cross, so get out, or mm -hmm. whatever sanctions you uh, impose. Um, and it, it's discouraging to me that people would rather leave a community 
then support people who are being, you know, adversely affected um, by bad behavior. Um, and, and a code of conduct will, will certainly help because it gives you something to fall back on. And that, I think that's a big part of the entire conversation that we've had with Demetra so far is that you're not alone. There are tools and out there that are standardized to help you through such difficulties. And there are other people out there who are working on the same things and they can help you too. I want to also call attention to, you know, for, for anyone who hasn't been watching this entire series, uh, Demetrius mentioned all in, mm -hmm. which is all in open source.com, which is a, uh, a cross industry attempt to address diversity issues in open source. And if you're not aware of that, I encourage you to have a look at that. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Well, we, we talked to one other person about this. Uh, we talked to Griselda Cuevas, who is a product manager of Google Account Security. Um, and we also posed the question to her about how, how do you work with anonymity and diversity and inclusion efforts and, and make those mesh? Um, and Griselda gave us a pretty solid answer. Let me take a step back here and maybe instead of going straight to the answer of that question, give us a little bit of perspective. The pandemic has made us move towards that type of interaction in, in day to day, right? Now we are far apart. We don't have the privilege of just turning around and asking a question or like even starting to build relationships with people who are working on a similar goal. And I mentioned this because a lot of people that I know, and I've seen this myself included, starting in new roles, new teams, new projects without the the benefit or the luxury of establishing close relationships. So I think like that put mm -hmm. us all in this like digital uh, world in which we need to build a relationship. Something that I've noticed in, in my experience working on these type of communities is that I'm going to fall back to that lack of awareness. I think diversity per se in the physical characteristics of someone is not what makes it, um, I don't want to say a problem, but a situation to be to be addressed. Okay. Um, it's more the fact that you t do gravitate towards people who think like you or who have common goals. Because as a human being, that minimizes the friction of having conversations. And I was actually listening to a really good book just this week about conversations and how the modern society, by migrating into digital mediums of communication, have lost the sense of conversation. And a conversation means having interactions where ideas are complemented, confirmed or challenged, instead of just exchange, which I think that uh you human beings especially in digital in digital mediums we're like i'm just gonna tell you what i think and then you uh, there's gonna be a pause and then you're gonna tell me what you think and we're gonna try to be defending the point but it's not a vivid live interaction of complementing ideas or trying to convey a, a meaning so all of these preamble to say I think that diversity is not necessarily about, oh, you have an identity and I know who you are. It's about that interaction that happens. And I believe open source is more natural towards that, right? You have projects that divide work on modules and patches. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about, about Apache Beam, which is one of the projects where I had the most experience with. We had different SDKs, different runners. It was a component of the project. And the default way for people to collaborate was I'm just going to collaborate with the person who is working on the Flink runner or, or the Spark runner, and my affinities are going to like evolve by default because this person is also interested in this. And it doesn't matter that this person doesn't look like me, doesn't speak the same language. We we have that common goal, and that kind of natural gravity starts to separate the community a little bit and removes that. Um, oh. I don't know you and you don't look like me. I'm not going to talk to you. It's more, I'm not going to interact with you because we're not necessarily working in the same project. 
and I believe that open source to that point has to, like establish more of this because you have that meritocracy pyramid. I'm like, okay, you're new. And then, okay, you maybe are a committer or you join uh, the, com the, the, com the contribution queue or you're a part of the PMC. And now you are uh, having a bit more responsibility. So your position changes a little bit. So I think that diversity situations in open source are not related to who you are and how you look. It's more about like, how you participate, interact, and relate to others, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So that being the case, how do you measure that? How do you build metrics around something that, that seems so esoteric? This is an excellent question, because right now I'm trying to solve a similar problem. Um, that cannot be measured in just normal signals. And the approach that I normally take with us is to look at, uh, at the thing in question as a system. And you see different components interacting with that. And you measure like a, a normal like network, almost like a graph. When you see which are the nodes with the most relationships, where are the the active the majority of the activity happening what is the gravitation towards a group i think it, the answer is not straightforward it's not like i'm going to tell you like just just count the number of github issues or jira tickets that have been resolved <laughs> it's more about understanding what are those notes and almost like mapping your project and seeing things beyond just the signal the the raw data more about what is happening right understanding the nature of the project the model and seeing two things i will say if i can expand that system i will say change over time how how much the how much big change has happened in that and measure that through the time right do we look the same have we been maintaining things in a future looking way or more in a reactive way and why haven't we been able to look more in a futuristic way, kind of anticipating the change versus just being reactive? And actually, I'm just like coming up with a very interesting thought, which is the lack of evolution or almost forward thinking movement in a project can be a really good indicator of lack of diversity. Hmm. And I said this because you see it in products all the time, right? And I was telling somebody the other day that, am I allowed to say product names? Sure. sure. All right. Uh, I was saying some uh, somebody that I just love Adobe PDF, or like Adobe Reader as a product, because that is a product that has shown an evolution from being in a CD and something that you install in your computer to be fully in the cloud and have a complete fresh, UI that looks very modern. And it's it's been built by a corporation that has been around for so long, right? And you can see how they really take in core the a few a few roles in technology that I feel that oftentimes have like not as value, like product managers, designers, and even salespeople, right? The, the sales force has have big inputs into this product. And the product has evolved. It's the, same, it's the same product, it has the same functionality, mm -hmm. but it has a completely distribution model, a completely different business model, and the look and feel feels relevant. So I think like to that point of like diversity and and how do you measure it, I will definitely say that the evolution of your, your project is a good indicator. Interesting. So Grez takes this yet another direction. Um, and, and if you, if you saw our previous episode, you'll remember that she talked about how diversity is not most importantly about the physical attributes of the person, but is, is more about diversity of thought. And then she continues that notion here, I think, um, saying that, uh, you know, anonymity, not anonymity doesn't really matter because what's important is the conversation or how people interact with the community. So it's it's more about 
being concerned about people's actions in the community rather than about you know whatever attributes they bring to the community. So it, it's an interesting way to look at it, and and it's it's consistent with what she said the first time, the first question. Yeah, and 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 anecdotally, there's a lot to support what she's talking about. People do tend to, you know, if you are interested in databases, you're going to be working on database projects. If you're interested in UI or UX, you're going to be working on that. So there'll be there's that commonality of, of skill and talent and background that's already kind of uh, bringing a community together. Um, and so, yeah, I, it's interesting that, you know, she continues to emphasize that and that part um, and the challenges around that kind of diversity as opposed to the, as you call it, the physical diversity. Um, I, th I think it's a pretty fair observation. Um, and and I would like to, honestly, I like her world view um, better than mine uh, <laughs> to, to see if, you know, if that, that actually can be the case all, all the way. The other thing that struck me when she was talking about that is, you know, talking about how the digital um, environment has made things more transactional rather than conversational. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, that I was an interesting that, sideline. Yeah, I think that's really true. I mean, so you and I have a long distance friendship. Um, I'm here in North Carolina, you're in Kentucky. And during the day we communicate usually on, you know, some kind of chat channel or something like mm -hmm. that. And it's very transactional. And, but then when we get together in this situation, this is more of a closer to an actual conversation, yeah. even though we're separated. Um, and the differences between the two kinds of conversations are certainly striking. And when she said it like that, I thought, oh yeah, that's, that's exactly true. And I wonder if, if that transactional nature of online digital communication um, has sort of like blunted um, the nuances of conversations and makes it easier to either A, ignore diversity, inequity, inclusion problems, which could be good or could be bad depending on how you look at it, and B, exacerbate DEI problems. Because if you're, you know, it, it's true. When you read somebody's text, sometimes you're like, what did they mean? What? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and you're playing that game because you have no signals in front of you um, to do that. I don't know. And, and ironically, the follow-up question that I asked just kind of reinforces this. If you can't measure it, it's not real. What if we don't have numbers? How will we know we're doing any good things? And, and one of the difficulties, one of the problems is that if your diversity effort is reduced to counting, if it's reduced to counting, if it's reduced to numbers and statistics, and we got 5% better this year, so therefore everything's awesome, it tends to lose a lot of the, a lot of the humanness, a lot of the nuance that comes out in those conversations. Yeah, and and I think there are ways. I mean, she she described ways that we could measure um, the health of a community's diversity because she was talking about looking at whole conversations mm -hmm. and looking at relationships and seeing, you know, mapping that territory more than mapping, um, you know, headcounts basically. Um, and I, you know, that's something that even Project Chaos is kind of getting into. You and you can do that around semantic analysis now on mailing lists or chat logs or whatever. Um, I think the thing that intrigued me that she said, and I would like to kind of delve more into this with her and other people, is this notion of the evolution of a project. That if the project stays static uh, for too long that that actually might be a, a, a symptom of lack of diversity mm -hmm. because everybody's thinking the same thing all the time and they're just, you know, they're, they're, they're in a rut. One of the things that I do at Apache is, is the, the Feathercast podcast. And uh, one of the questions that I have asked more than one project is you've, you've been around for 10 years. How do you keep the project interesting and vibrant. I mean, you've already solved all the, the problems that you started out to solve. How do you how do you keep vibrant? And and there's two kinds of answers. There's the answers that are 
well, we keep having new people coming to the project that are using it in unexpected ways and they help us evolve it. And the other kind of answer that I get is, well, we're just in maintenance. You know, we, we kind of keep plodding along doing the same thing because that's what our users, our current users want. And, and in those answers, I've seen what, what you're talking about and what, what Grizz is talking about here, about how if you don't have that, not just diversity of thought, but, but continual addition of new contributors with different thoughts, then your project does just stagnate. And, and often people are content with that stagnation because they see it as we're done, we've solved all the problems. Yeah, well, and it also depends, I think, on your motivation for being a part of a project because sometimes mm -hmm. people want to build and then sometimes people want to build and belong and sometimes they want to just belong. And to me, those pro those projects that you described that are kind of in, in maintenance mode, maybe it's just like, well, I, I still have this sense of belonging. This is still our thing, yeah. um, even if we're not really doing a lot of new stuff. But yeah, I think the the metrics around mapping that progression and those relationships and the nuances around that would be really interesting because we've seen that before. You can be on a you can be in a project or a team and you can see clicks forming. Um, and clicks are not always a good thing um and so if, if things get too clicky then you you see a breakdown in communication there's there could be more adversarial confrontations and things like that um so yeah um it's certainly a unique approach but um a lot to think about so this was a really cool segment because none of the answers had anything to do with how I anticipated the question going. And, and to me, that, that shows that, you know, we pick the right people to talk to because they're people that have thought deeply about these topics in, in ways that I haven't. So this was fun. It, it was indeed. And thank you very much for everyone for coming along on this part of the journey on the open road. We'll be back um, in a couple of weeks with another look at uh, an aspect of diversity, equity, and inclusion with our wonderful guests. Until then, my name is Brian Prophet. And I'm Rich Bowen. And thank you for joining us on The Open Road.